you know, it's a really important thing to, to talk about and be fully okay with saying proudly, I stutter, but there's so many other cool things about me. And I actually would love, love, love to say my speech is one of the cool things about me. I, I think I'm unique, it's cool. Welcome to Some Stutter Law, a podcast by the Communication Collaborative. Some Stutter Law is Newfoundland Labrador's first podcast about living with communication disorders. We speak directly to people living with speech and language disorders and or others such as speech language pathologists, researchers, educators, family members, and allies. We use inclusive language and themes to help rebuild confidence and hope by dismantling myths, stigma, stereotypes, and barriers. My name is Greg O'Grady, and I am a person who stutters and host of Some Stutter Law. Stuttering is a disorder that stems from the neural processing area of the brain that controls speech and has no effect on the person's intelligence. However, people who stutter and others with communication disorders are more likely to be ostracized, misunderstood, and suffer from anxiety, depression, and self-esteem. Some stutter law mission is dismantling and rebuilding communication disorders. Let's start listening. Our mandate is, in the spirit of Newfoundland Labrador humor, robust, and frank interactive discussions, some Subtle Law podcast aims to rebuild confidence and hope for people who live with communication disorders by dismantling myths, stigmas, stereotypes, and barriers. Some Subtle Law objectives are raising awareness, education, understanding, and acceptance of communication disorders by providing support, current information, research, and resources. Raising awareness that communication disorders can impact a person's life emotionally, educationally, physically, socially, and vocationally. Creating a safe space where guests can be themselves without fear of being judged. Today, some study law welcomes Jessica Deleuz. Jessica completed her undergraduate at Wilfrid Laurier University in Business with a specialization in human resources. She currently works at, as a senior human resources g- generalist for Moffitt and Powell Rona. She has been accepted into the Queen Smith MBA program and will be attending in January 2023. Thank, uh, uh, congratulations, Jessica. Thank you. <laughs> Jessica is also a young entrepreneur and a person who stutters who seeks to establish a not-for-profit foundation to help raise money for people who stutter that cannot afford speech therapy. To support Jessica in her vision, Some Stutter Law would be hosting a special future episode to support Jessica in the goal to give back and make her vision a reality. In solidarity and collaboration, uh, representatives from the Newfoundland Labrador Studying Association, the Communications Collaborative, Studying Scholarship Alliance, and the Canadian Studying Association will be coming together to share their early experiences, challenges, and successes during their time when they were establishing their individual associations and community group. By sharing all of our wealth of early experiences, challenges, and successes, Jessica will have a solid foundation to establish her vision. And you will, Jessica. Oh, so, so, uh, Jessica, so uh, Jessica, well, you know, welcome to uh, uh, Some Study Law, and uh, we you know, we are pleased to have uh, to have have you as as a guest uh, today. So, uh, you know, Jessica, would you know you know would uh, would you know would you share with our listeners a little bit about your history as a person who stutters? Yeah, so I never remember not stuttering and not going to speech therapy. 
Uh, I was probably around the ages of two, three, four when my verbal communication was just beginning. Uh, when my parents noticed that I was having some difficulty and um, compared to my twin brother, um, we were kind of at different levels. So my parents proceeded to take me in to our th th doctor and then I went to a specialist um, and it was determined that I did in fact have a, a speech impediment or a, or a stutter. Um, from there, I was enrolled in speech therapy at um, um, Melbourne College, um, Western University. That's where my first experience with therapy was. Um, they have really great um, masters of speech therapy students that run their clinics. So I had a really good opportunity to kind of get my feet wet with therapy there. Um, from a fluency standpoint, Greg, I didn't really notice kind of how serious speech was probably until my later youth. So I'd say between the ages of seven and nine. And for me, I think why I noticed it then in particular is because that's when the bullying started. Um, I think when kids are really young and when you, you don't have that emotional awareness or intelligence maybe yet because you're just so 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 innocent that I never really thought anything of it but it was as I got older and into my early tweens I guess you would call it um that's when I really noticed that I really struggled with my speech and um I would rate my fluency probably as low as a 20 to 30 percent at times because I really, really struggled with my heart of constants. So my B's, P's, D's, G's. Um, and having a name like Jessica DeLuce really um, mm. was a challenge growing up as a kid. Um, so probably around that time as my speech kind of digressed, um, I moved into private sector speech therapy. Um, I went to a few different ones and I'm the first to say that if I don't, if I don't, if I don't vibe with someone right away, um, it's really not going to, uh, go well <laughs> for either person. And, uh, it wasn't until I met, um, L Lori Holmes, uh, she, owns a private practice in London called um, Homes Well Spoken. Um, I met her and I think it was a match at true sight, if you will. Uh, she kind of from day one challenged me. I was always one of those kids that had to be challenged. And it was with her every Monday night at 5.30 for, oh gosh, um, I would say at least six to eight years and every week, all we do is, you know, first of all, talk about how my week was, why I think my stuttering was better or worse that week. And then we do some pretty sig significant practice with my targets and or however everyone calls them, I call them my targets. And um, it was through repetitive practice and the buy in from my parents as well that Lori really encourage my parents' involvement with my speech therapy because it I wasn't alone in my journey was how my speech truly, truly progressed to where it was today or to where it is today. Um, probably around 13, 14 is when I kind of mastered all of my targets and it then became a very kind of mental game for me, if you will, in the sense that I knew what I had to do to get myself out of a block or to get a sound out. But if I didn't believe I could do it, then nothing, it wouldn't matter how well I knew my targets. So from 14 to about 18 is when the mental game of stuttering really, really comes in and takes place and being 27 now it's it's still a mental game for me but it was those 
really crucial years in high school where I really had to, it was all on me. It was only, only I was the one that could determine how my fluency was. So it took a lot, but somehow I'm now working in human resources on the phone from eight to 10 hours a day, dealing with both good and bad, which can cause my speech to be better or worse, depending on the, the, the type of conversation. And I get through it and I accept that, you know what, there will be bad days and we just, we just got to take it one day at a time, but I, I know I can do it. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jessica, you, uh, you, 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 you mentioned that, uh, targets, targets, you know, you really put a lot of emphasis on sort of, uh, learning your targets, your targets, um, it's, it's a mental game. So when, you know, when you, you know, uh, when you just said that sometimes you have a good day, bad day, when, uh, when you go off your targets, how do you self care for yourself? How do you sort of get back on track? For me, first and foremost, I know for sure if I do not get a good night's sleep, I know my speech definitely will be affected. Um, so if I know it hasn't been an ideal day, um, I do make sure, you know, I go and I relax and I go to sleep early. I really kind of rest my body because sometimes that's all it takes. Um, I'm also a firm believer in, um, in physical fitness and, and, and exercise. And I'm one of the crazies that bought a Peloton through the pandemic. So, um, sometimes I need to go on the bike for an extra 20 minutes and just, um, kind of work through some of the things that are inside my head kind of preventing me from using my targets. Um, Should it be more serious in the sense that it's just been, for example, it's been more of a negative than a positive week at work. There's a lot of tough conversations that have had to be had, or it's just not fun because we all know work can't be fun all the time. Um, I'm very fortunate to have an incredible massage therapist that I can text and she'll try and make half an hour for me and we'll just work on my jaw and my neck. Um, That currently is where I carry all of my intention um, to the point where my face will actually get swollen. Um, Because if I'm blocking so much, it just, you you can barely, very clearly see. Um, So I do try and go see her and and especially maybe a little bit more some months than others. Um, But those are kind of my, um, my kind of self care. But then I think the one thing to remember too is I'm a firm believer in one day at a time and sometimes you have to let go of the day before and it's been a little bit harder through the pandemic to remember that for sure but um if if i can keep that in my mantra then i hopefully will wake up with a fresh attitude and can just move forward from maybe a tougher speech day yesterday Mm. You, uh, uh, you, you, you mentioned that your targets help you to maintain your fluency. Mm-hmm. Now, what is your thoughts about the F word, the fluency word? Is it positive or negative? Is it adding more stress on you, or do you have a different definition of your fluency, of the word fluency? Yeah, that's a good question. Um... To me, fluency means that, honestly, I just make it through. And I, I've come to terms and I've accepted that my fluency is not going to be perfect. Um, and I know based on the, the, the toolkit of targets that I have in front of me that I now 
can subconsciously pull out when I need to, I know that they are the deciding factor for my fluency. So to me, if, if I know that I'm using my targets to the best of their ability, that my fluency is just going to be just fine. And I will get stuck. I will stumble. I will hold my vowels, which is also something that I have re-struggled with in the pandemic. And sometimes I wonder if it's because I've been wearing a mask. Um, but I, I, I know that I will get through. So fluency for me isn't necessarily positive. It's not necessarily negative. Um, isn't just a word that I know that I have a very close as, as association with. And it, mm. I just know that I will get through. When you, uh, you, you, know, you, 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 know, you speak very highly of, of your, 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 of Lori, your, your, your speech, you know, speech pathologist. I do. What you know, when you know, when you first met her, what you know, what made you feel that she was a good fit for you as a person who stutters? You see, this is where that. A lot of the, I shouldn't say a lot, but my, you know, my personal feeling is that, 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 you know, that, you know, that, that when people who start to go to seek out a therapist, they, you know, they, you know, they don't really know, uh, you know, that, you know, that, you know, that this is an interview, but they, they're also interviewing yeah. the therapist as a fit. And I think this is, this is a mentality thing as well. So what, you know, when you, when you went in, how, how did you approach it? It's tough to remember kind of exactly what it was about Lori when I first started. Um, but I specifically remember and initially it's, it's weird how you remember certain things. I started in the month of October and I know this because she had in her waiting room, a gas fireplace and it, and I was like gravitated towards it in one of my first lessons. And I, I have to be honest, the first 10 to 15 minutes of my th therapy, we would f sit in her waiting room because I liked having my back against the fire. <laughs> and, and that's what I, that's what I remember. And we would just sit and talk about my week or just talk about life. And then She'd be like, "All right, let's 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 go to work." So then we'd move over to her, to her space. But I I think when it came to Lori and Mai's relationship, um, I was a very because my family and close friends that watch this are gonna say liar, but I was a very shy, quiet kid because of my speech, especially when I didn't know you, it took me a lot to really kind of warm up. And Lori was always challenging me. And she challenged me from the very beginning with my speech. And we would spend some of my sessions just calling random people or random businesses in the phone book to ask them questions. Um, she would she would she would record me sometimes and we'd watch it back to watch some of my technique and my targets um she would support me if i didn't want to do presentations in front of my classmates at school but she would make sure that she worked with my teachers to provide me all the resources that i felt confident enough to present in front of my my peers um, and I will always be appreciative of the fact that she wanted me to get out there and not just sit back and hide. And I, I think it was the fact that she believed in me, I guess, from the very beginning. Um, not, not saying that speech therapists don't do that. I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure every speech therapist <laughs> does. I want to very clearly say that. Um, but it was just... It was just this connection, I guess, with her. Um, and the other thing that I really admire in looking back on my speech therapy journey is the influence that she had with my parents as well. Um, so just to give you a little bit of context, I do have 
stuttering on both sides of my family. Um, mm. My grandfather um, on my mom's side, and then I have an aunt on my dad's side. Not not as severe as myself, but um, I, I do have some family history. So my my parents knew a little bit about stuttering, but they didn't know what to do. And the beautiful thing about Lori was I was sent home as as summary every week and I still have them upstairs um, of everything we worked on and the notes for my parents and things that she wanted us to, to work on and what we'd be doing next week. And why I remember Mondays at 5.30 is because I was excited going. I I really enjoyed it. And my parents were excited for me going because they knew how much I enjoyed it. I went to speech therapy to a few other places prior and I would cry and refuse to get out of the car because I did not want to go in that room with that other person. But as soon as I met Lori, it was just like everything kind of clicked into place. Mm. Yeah. Jessica, I, 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 I was on a, a Zoom call a meeting today, and one of the the attendees who who stutters in in a in a in in introduce herself, but but she also said that. Uh, that you know that uh, she you know she in embraced you know b- 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 embraced her identity as a, as a person who stutters. Now you know so so I thought to myself for a you know person who stutters to you know, to say that I you know I I I, I embrace my identity. As a person who stutters, you know, uh, what are your thoughts about that? It took a long time, I think, for myself to to feel that I am not just the person that talks weird. I am much more than that. Um, to embrace my speech is to come to terms with it and to realize that it's just a small, a small, great part of me that makes Jessica Deleuze and who she, who she is. Um, through, through high school and university, um, I always found my stuttering very embarrassing to talk about, and I didn't want to bring it up with people unless I had to. Um, and I, and partly a little bit because it's embarrassing at in my perception to myself, I thought it was embarrassing. And honestly, it's sometimes difficult to explain because people want to know why, like, what's wrong with you? And I'm like, there's nothing wrong. Um, So um, to, I think just as I grew older and I met new people and I saw the world and I saw all these great resources on social media that I realized that, you know, it's a really important thing to, to talk about and be fully okay with saying proudly, I stutter, but there's so many other cool things about me. And I actually love love to say my speech is one of the cool things about me. I I think I'm unique. It's cool, especially because it's a smaller percentage of women than men than men that that do have um uh, that do that do stutter. So I think it's kind of cool and to fully embrace the fact that I do I do stutter has just 
made me accept the fact that I do have it and I should be promoting it. I should be sharing my stories because I feel fortunate in the sense that compared to some other people, I've had a very successful story and I don't want people who maybe have lower fluency, if, if you will, I don't want them to give up if they feel like they're never going to get anywhere because I don't want them to feel alone. So yeah, yeah. I, I feel that I've embraced it the best I can and I'm proud of it. And yeah, I'm, I'm excited to keep letting people know it's okay and you know what just yeah everything will mm. will be fine <laughs> does that make sense <laughs> uh, it, it 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 does jessica it does now when you know when we you know when we talk about in 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 in, in embracing our yeah. stuttering it also sort of you know uh, uh Reminds me of of, of the 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 you know the the ongoing challenge about accepting yeah. one stutter, yep, stuttering you know, stuttering yeah. and accepting acceptance of one stuttering. You know, what are your thoughts about that? I mean, what do you, you know, one can embrace their stuttering, but do you do you feel it's the same uh, uh, thing as saying that I accept my stuttering? Good question. I feel they are different, but they work together. So when I started um, really solidifying my positive self-talk, um, which was the phrase that Lori had for me because I was always in my head, like, like I mentioned about my, about my speech. Um, when I fully turned on my positive self-talk and I began believing in myself, that's when I truly began to ex accept that I'm, that I was not going to be one of the kids that ever outgrew her stutter. It was going to be a constant in my life, and I have everything in front of me to, to manage it. So as I grew in high school, that's when I became to accept it. And then I don't think... I truly embraced it until I began being an advocate and talking openly about it and sharing experiences and having conversations with people about it. And, or ha should someone make a comment or make fun of me, which it still happens, embracing it is standing up for myself and putting them in their place. <laughs> um, so that's, that's to me, it, they, they work in accepting and embracing. They work very closely together in my mind, but I feel I accepted, which led me to then embrace it. Mm -hmm. uh, what are your thoughts on, on self-disclosure? Because you know, uh, I, I always make sure that when you know when I introduce some stutter law, uh, I say that yeah. I'm a person who stutters because with my history of being a, a covert stutter, I always try mm -hmm. to hide my stuttering, which often you know you know has often yeah. worked and worked against myself in terms of developing a stronger sense of identity. So, uh, in terms of self-disclosure, what are your thoughts about that? Oh, um. I, for me, it kind of depends on the, the circumstance. Um, so a prime example is um, three years ago in my job interview um, for the for the job I have now, one of um, one of the first questions that they always ask is, so tell me about yourself and kind of how you got here and um, I would always say, oh, I'm a person with a stutter. Um, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't define me. Um, and I say a little bit on that. Um, and then just another 
fun, not fun, but nerve wracking kind of self disclosure was um, for my Queen's MBA um, profile. Part of the application process was a timed video where you did not know the questions and you, you had, I think, a minute or two minutes to, um, to answer the question. Well, let me tell you, um, leading up to that, I was so nervous. I was literally dreading doing this because if there's one thing for a person who stutters that, I don't know, maybe, maybe this isn't true, but for, but being timed and being in front of a video are like two of the worst things in my opinion. So um, my stuttering never really came up in the, the, the in the application process up until that point where I reached out to my um, admissions advisor and I said, listen, I'm going to be very transparent with you. I have a, I have a, I have a stutter and I'm very worried about this environment, how it will affect my answers, especially not knowing what the question will be, because normally I would practice, practice, practice beforehand. So I was able to submit a little paragraph on my profile um, for that. Um, but other than that, in my usual day-to-day -day life, um, it, I, I don't necessarily disclose. Um, sometimes I will get funny looks or comments made, and that's when I will say, "Well, I'm. I actually have a. a I actually have a stutter. Um, so I'd appreciate if you don't finish my sentences or if you don't look at me like that. It's really. This was during wearing masks." Um, I really don't appreciate you looking at me. It's just more th difficult for me to communicate behind a mask. Um, and just certain things and in certain settings like that. Um, but um, I, I think something that I have learned um, being more involved in some of the, the social media groups and chatting with yourself and I do think I will want to start kind of just dis disclosing it a bit more because it will create a little bit more of a, an educational and awareness piece behind it. So, mm. mm -hmm. Jessica, I, 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 I listen, listen to your high school chapel speech that you made on February the 2nd, 2013. Yes. And uh, you know, I I, I I I was so impressed with the uh, with listeners listening listening to you, and uh, you know, if you know, like if if I was a normal, you know, I shouldn't say normal. If if I was a, 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 a non person who stutters, you you did have some disfluency, but. Very few, so 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 something like that. I would consider uh, uh, you as as a, a non-person who started with normal dysfluency. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, uh, so so for you to you know to stand up there and and give this speech, how you know what, you know what, you know, what was your reaction first of all afterwards, and how, how well, did you prepare for it? <laughs> so I have to be honest with you. I have a little secret. I was wearing my. I was wearing my speech easy through that speech. Um, it's one oh, of the okay. um, hearing devices that it sounds like Mickey Mouse is um, talking and she picks up my voice very, very quickly. So um, having her in my ear and practicing that speech probably a thousand times before. Mm. Um, and you can't tell, but I was actually looking at my dad the entire time because my family got to come up and listen. So I can assure you, um, yeah, I still, I got to be honest, I think I, I blacked out saying the speech. I don't remember. <laughs> All I remember is walking up to that podium and that's the last thing I remember um 
but that was my first ex experience talking about my stuttering in such detail and especially to such a large group of people i've never spoken to that many people before um so mm. but i did have a little bit of help i i, I won't lie <laughs> yeah um you know, uh, uh, you know, I liked, you know, like, you know, liked your theme of of your speech, your your themes on courage and leader, leadership. That was a, a powerful speech. Thank you. Powerful speech. Thank you, Jessica. Wonderful. Now, uh, uh, Jessica, let's you know, you know, uh, let's circle back now to you know to your vision of yeah. of starting up a not for profit. So, so do you want to share it with our listeners? You know, where, you know, where this vision came from? Yeah. So um, probably pre-COVID times, um, once, once I started working in the working world um, and I myself got on benefits at work, um, I went into my benefits package to see how much that speech therapy would be covered throughout the year. And... I was astonished to see how low that number is considering for, in my opinion, true successful speech therapy is not a once a month type of ordeal. Um, it's a once a week, once every other week, an extensive practice with a speech therapist for a certain amount of time. Um, so I went and did a little bit more research with other um with other insurance companies just in my own personal time along with um joining some different um people who stutter uh facebook groups and whatnot and i realized that um unfortunately although insurance and benefit packages are becoming more common with the workplace um they're really not putting enough towards speech therapy unless you have a plan where you can pick what you want within it. And even that um, doesn't cover enough to really get the help that someone needs. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm going to talk about her again, but I sit and reflect on my speech today and it wouldn't be for, for those Monday nights at 5.30 with Limplory that I wouldn't be where I am today. And I want as many people as possible to have that opportunity to be able to get the help if they need it. So um, I wanted to, and I have, and I have started the process of creating a non-for-profit foundation called the Wellspoken Foundation. And it is going to raise funds and focus on providing speech therapy funds for families that may need that may need it. Um, I I'm located in London, Ontario currently, so I'm going to hopefully get it up and going. Uh, by the end of 2022, before I get going to uh, Queens for my MBA. Um, and then once the groundwork's done, I just want to keep raising funds and provide these funds to people that need it because I want everyone to have as enjoyable of a therapy experience that I did. And I also would love to advocate um to our government leaders for more awareness around the importance of speech therapy and how we can get more resources for people just out in our provinces and in our country as well so not not just from our foundation but what can we do as a society to encourage these insurance companies to raise their bars for money that can provide coverage or what can our government do to subsidize speech therapy and speech pathologists so more people can go see them and i really hope that 
as time goes on, that we can have more conversations about this because the number one thing people do every day is publicly speak. And I never want someone to feel that they cannot speak and have their and don't want their voice to be heard because I really believe everyone has something worth saying. And it's super important that no one ever feel that they cannot say it. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So, so Jessica, do you, do you have a, a time frame for when, you know, when you will be applying for the not-for-profit status? Like, is it looking at a few years, two years? Yeah. So right now I'm, I'm just in the consult um, phase um, with, a lawyer and then with some contacts that have ex existing non-for-profits and just to see kind of how the ball is rolling um and unfortunately um from the non-for-profit and the tr trademark standpoint um they're Unfortunately, it's just the excuse for everything right now. COVID has delayed a lot of processes at the federal and provincial level. So it's a little bit more difficult than I was anticipating. Um, but I really would love um, over the next, I would say, one to two years to really have everything settled or almost settled um, so we can um, kind of just be able to start raising funds and um, creating the uh, the awareness. Where did, 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 did the name come from, Well Spoken? <laughs> so Well Spoken is actually um, a, it is dedicated towards Lori. So uh, Lori's private practice was called um, Homes Well Spoken. And okay. yeah, so the hardest, to me, the most difficult part of this was I've had two years cooped up in a pandemic and I could not think of a name <sighs> and it was driving me nuts. And I was bouncing ideas off my family, my friends, and I just, I wasn't settled on an idea. And I kid you not, I woke up one morning, I shot out of bed and I'm like, oh my God, the Well-Spoken Foundation. <laughs> And it just kind of came to me and I, and as soon as I thought of it, I said there was no better name than that. So. The well-spoken. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Well, uh, well, Jessica, uh, you know, I, 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 I wish you much success with, with this because mm -hmm. there, you know, there, you know, you know, the, you know there, there is a definite, Need for you know for speech therapy, and unfortunately, one of the the, uh, the major deficits is the funding. Mm -hmm. it's, just, it's just fees trying to get the, uh, the money to actually seek out therapy, yeah. take therapy. You know. And the one thing I will say is, if anyone listening would love to find out more, um, or um, just want to have a conversation about what I'm working on, or if they have any ad advice or anything, please um, do not hesitate to um, reach out. Um, I can somehow provide my contact information to um, the podcast and I'd be happy to connect with anyone. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, Jessica, b before we end, uh, do, 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 do you have have any advice to give to to people who stutter in terms of people who are struggling? I think first and foremost is you are definitely not alone. Um, I, I, I like I mentioned, I never want anyone to ever feel that what they say is not worth saying. It definitely is. I can promise them that. Um, you just you just have to believe in yourself and know that there's a community behind you that knows exactly how you're feeling, knows exactly the anxiety you feel picking up the phone or having to say your name at Starbucks. It's not, it's, it, it's daunting, but 
we are here as people who stutter to band together and know that we will get through it. We will be okay. And, and you have lots of both free and speech therapy resources around you. I do feel that there is more and more conversations about stuttering and um, links and tips and support groups. So please join them and introduce yourself and we will be there to, to support you in every best way that we can. Mm. Now, uh, uh, being a person who 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 uh, stutters, how how you know how how has stuttering impacted your life for the better? I think the amount of empathy that I have towards people is probably because of my own ex my own experiences. Um, I really everyone's going through something whether it's visible or invisible and i never want to judge anyone for that because we all have our own struggles and i think my stuttering has taught me empathy um but as well to always try and see the good in people and i that may not make sense but i'll but when kids were making fun of me as when I was younger, my my mom always told me, Jessica, they're not making fun of you because they're mean. They're making fun of you because they don't understand. And a kid's natural tendency is to laugh and mimic. And I don't want you taking it personal. And eventually it will be up to you to educate them. And I think because of that advice from her, I always felt that you, you want to know what they, they just, they just don't know. And once I did have the courage to educate my classmates at 10 years, 11 years old, um, I, I really did kind of, um, they, I, that advice just worked and they were all good people and i mean let's be real though that there are some real jerks out there so i don't want anyone to uh, <laughs> they were they were oh, yeah um but i i think just being able to see the good in people and, and, and empathy and um i love being different i love being unique i love how it's a little kirk about me i guess um, I, I think that it's sometimes a great conversation starter, like if things are not awkward or, you know, um, yeah, I just, I, I love the fact that I, that I stutter. Mm -hmm. It's taken me a long time to say that, but mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. here I am. <laughs> <clears throat> do you know, do you have, have, have have any thoughts about uh, 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 people who who uh, stutter, who you know, who you know, who who are struggling with the emotional component of stuttering? You know, you know, we often talk about the stutter iceberg below the surface, and this this is where I feel the yeah. most of the work is needed, especially with mm -hmm. you know with you know with you know with a speech language pathologist. But in terms of addressing some of the emotional issues, do you think? Do you feel as person stutter? It's so important to address the emotional, uh, uh, the the uh, the you know the, the emotional component to to really benefit from speech therapy. I absolutely do, um, and it's just from my own personal experience of the fact that if I didn't believe in myself and something that Lori always talked about, especially as I became a teenager, was your speech is going to be dependent on your friends, your grades. Are you doing well? What high school pressures are you facing right now? Um, which eventually leads into what 27 year old pressures like this. 
this um, housing market's crazy. I'm not going to be able to afford anything anytime soon. Um, and just like a variable of factors that can affect me, which then affects my speech. Um, and the emotional side of my stuttering was, I can't do it. Like, I can't. I'm not gonna. St I'm not gonna talk today. This is horrible. Um, I feel that the best person to really sit and reflect and address it is going to be you yourself, and with the support of great friends and family, to really validate that n n nothing's wrong. You are a great human being and you will get through this and you will be okay. Um, so, yeah. So to me, I feel the emotional side of stuttering and kind of like, like, like I said, it comes back to just from my experience, I know my targets, but is it the belief in myself and what's going on around me that will truly kind of validate that you know what I can do this I will do this mm -hmm. you know and, and, and you know it, you're so right uh, Jessica because it it is it is so important for people who stutter who you know who who are, who are in a dark place to 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 really reach out to mm -hmm. to to you know to to other people who stutter attend support groups, conferences, yeah. you know, because, you know, m m m many people who stutter feel so, so isolated mm -hmm. at times and, and alone, you know? Mm -hmm. They really mm -hmm. do. And I've said it a couple times now, but I just want to say it again. Everyone has something worth saying, and I never want anyone to feel like they can't vocalize the thoughts in their head because of the fact that they stutter and I promise you if I ever met you and you got stuck on every single word I will sit and listen and look at you until you finish and I know there's hundreds of people like us out there that will that will support so to anyone listening I just want you to all remember that because it's it's really, really important. Mm. Well, uh, well, uh, you know, thank, th th thank you very much for your time uh, today, uh, Jessica. Do, 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 do you have any last words? Uh, no, it's been a pleasure. And Greg, I'm so happy that we've been able to meet virtually and be able to chat a few times. I know. I'm hoping that this is just the beginning for us working together and I, I will be bothering you with all the questions and advice <laughs> as I kind of get and move forward um, with, the, with the Well Spoken Foundation. Um, and I can't wait to maybe come back on and update. And um, yeah, I'm just really excited for what the next few years hold. Well, wonderful. Well, well, Jessica, you know, you're you're always welcome to uh, 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 to call me and and touch touch base with me. Perfect. Okay. Well, <laughs> thank thank uh, thank you again. Yeah. Thank you. Bye now. Bye now. Some stutter love is hosted by Greg O'Grady. It is produced recorded and edited by Paul De Decker, as well as Luca Dino, who, by the way, wrote this jazzy theme music. Leah Bugden and Alicia Megason command our pages on Instagram and TikTok. Editing assistance was provided by the Labrador Languages Preservation Laboratory, or Labradori, at the Memorial University of Newfoundland. You can listen to or subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Anchor, and Spotify. Video versions of each episode are found on our YouTube page. Some Stutterla is a production of the Communication Collaborative. Thanks again for listening to this episode of Some Stutterla. 
We just wanted to tell you about our plans to keep you posted on Jessica's adventure and starting the Well Spoken Foundation. We feel that her awesome initiative is so important to thousands of Canadians that we'll do our part in supporting her along the way. So, check out future episodes of Some Stutter Love, or subscribe to our mailing list via the link at the bottom of our website, somestarla.ca, and we'll bring you all the latest on Jessica's progress towards building the Well Spoken Foundation. Thank you.